We're moving closer and closer to so many violent encounters between the Mafia families and the Phantom Troop coming for Hisoka, and not to mention the princes and their distrust of each other while they slowly get whittled down. Something big is coming, and it's almost here. But we're actually skipping back a few moments before the reveal of whatever shocked the troop members. And Nobunaga's told his weapon being on full display will be a problem because it's clearly made for aggression. So the Cha'ar member is willing to take it to keep him from being shot by the newer, more nervous guards. Even Finks and Phaeton think Nobunaga's showing it off too much. Then we're given an ominous look at the outer part, but still inside of the Black Whale. So the troop can make it their way to Tier 2. The heavy black lines Togashi uses and the massive expanse of it gives you a creepy feel instantly. A rickety staircase is waiting for them to climb. Everything about these panels screams, danger is imminent. Finks points out how the awful smell reminds him of Meteor City, since there's waste from thousands of people passing through there. Tijiao makes it clear that the people in Tier 5 are treated worse than sewage, though, since the processing plants are above their area. And to the surprise of no one, the two allied mafia families, Cha'ar and Ziyu, are the ones who deal with the sewage. This is likely to be able to dispose of bodies at their convenience without being caught. Kind of like how the mafia are often shown owning butcher shops or pig farms or whatever, you know? But Nobunaga pokes a hole in that reasoning, telling Tijiao that since they hire contractors for the messier work and don't expect to be told about the results or murders, people from the High Lu could take advantage of them. All they would have to do is pretend to be working with waste, call people in, kill them off, and then send them down the line to be processed. Tijiao clearly isn't used to the brutality of the world because he feels normal after hearing them speak that way. But because of them coming to that conclusion, Nobunaga has to go back, leaving only the other two to face whatever might be up ahead. I already said it was too little of a group to face the Hale Lee, but this seems way worse. Also, since Nobunaga and Henry were the ones who dealt with the trap feature of the Hale Lee's hideout, it would have been best that they stayed. But since he insists on questioning some workers, well, he has to relay all of the information to Finks and Phaeton as clearly as he can. It also works as a good recap for us since those events happened in chapters that came out years ago. Phaeton doesn't seem worried about that mechanism from one of the guard's abilities, but Finks has the more realistic reaction of being frustrated with Nobunaga keeping those details from them until now. Going forward, we move through the disposal areas and the spot Henry left the tracker for them. It continues to beep its location underneath the shelf. Meanwhile, the funeral proceeds for Halkenberg, with his body being moved where people are able to pay their final respects. A huge crowd is gathered and Sakuro blends in among them alongside Henry. But Lynch is missing. We know she's dead and left somewhere, but Henry wasn't part of that whole body switch up that Bono Lenov pulled. Still, because Bono made a good excuse for her, Henry tells Sakuro to meet up with her later and question the Hey Lee members. Except, someone else has discovered her dead body, and Henry's notified right away. The patrolling guards were the ones to find her and made sure to contact Henry's people. Her body is twisted in a gruesome way with her head backwards, a brutal way to be killed honestly. But because it seems like it was done by a professional, they don't immediately point a finger at the troop, but the Hey Lee again. Henry wasn't so convinced though, even suspecting Hisoka of being the cause. But then Sakuro mentions that if it were Hisoka's doing, he'd be dead too. Not only that, but Lynch was speaking in a way that seemed unusually calm for the situation that they're in. Showing off his deduction abilities again, Henry puts it all together. It wasn't Lynch that woke him up, but someone pretending to be her. Unfortunately, they think Hisoka has some kind of manipulation ability that would allow him to change into her which isn't the case. They know so little about his Nen techniques that that's the only thing they can assume. It's surprising they don't think that someone could both be pretending to be Hisoka to put the blame on him and then switch to Lynch exactly for him to be further accused. But since they don't have enough information, just assuming it was a manipulation ability works better for them. And if that's the case, what would having her say she's going back to the office accomplish, right? Well, we know it's to keep them away from the troops' movements, but Henry's a smart dude, and realizes it would be better if she had just disappeared altogether, 
sending them on a wild goose chase looking for her. Since we know the limit was purposely implanted into their minds, it's interesting to see how these two are getting to the same conclusion together. And just with Lynch forcefully pushing the thought that Hisaoka was the cause, it would force them to stick to that answer. But it didn't, because Henry realized it was a way to manipulate who they point the finger at. Sakuro is just a ball of confusion at this point, having woken up not too long ago and seen his partner dead on the ground. And in a few minutes, Henry has pieced it all together, fully aware that there was a fake Hisoka, which led to her death and being replaced. Nothing gets past this guy. The Zhiyu family may not have many members left, but Henry is worth the 300 members they lost to the Hale Lee. But now that the cat's out of the bag, things aren't going to be so peaceful between the Zhiyu and the Cha'ar anymore. Seeing as the Cha'ar are working in close connection with the troop, and Henry has no clue which member it is. It doesn't matter. They're all an enemy now that they've killed Lynch. Luckily, they're not willing to make any drastic moves until they're certain who exactly posed as her and killed her. But one thing is certain, when they find out the truth, it's on. A huge religious ceremony is held for Halkenberg, as expected of someone with so many followers and fans. At the same time, Krollo opens his book of Nen abilities and uses one from a lady named Narumi. The instructions involve dialing a number for a phone call, which can then lead him to his ideal partner. In this case, it has to do with someone who can help take out Hisoka, and not a romantic evening with a woman. As the phone rings, we can also see that it's not coming from this massive crowd gathering to see Halkenberg. That narrows it down slightly, but keep in mind that there's 200,000 people on the Black Whale, so there are so many places that Krollo could attempt to find them. And what if he just has bad luck? And I know that sounds a little bit like slapstick comedy, but it's still a possibility on a ship this big. Krollo realizes how difficult that might be, so he wonders if he should widen the criteria of the person he's looking for instead. With so many strong Nen users on tier one, where all the princes are, as well as their guards and those meant to be curses, it makes sense that he'd consider going there. But it's not for the people. It's for what they use in the succession contest, the sacred treasures. This is where things get really interesting because we're about to find out what Krollo's secret plan is. The three relics Krollo's after turn out to be the seed urn used in the ceremony for the contest, the sacred object that watches everything, probably to ensure the princes don't directly attack each other, and the same for the Nen beasts. It's a Zen Buddha that looks more sinister than spiritual. And the last is called the Blade of Divine Favor, which is basically meant as a prize and symbol for the next king of Kaken. This, I'd wager, is the most valuable, considering it's likely been passed down for countless generations. According to Krollo, without those three sacred treasures, the wealth of the Kaken Empire and all their power would collapse into nothing. And considering that he's always been a master thief, wanting all the biggest riches in the world, how can he pass up on those relics? Not only that, but he thinks they'd be the best way to level up his skill hunter ability, so that he can find the one who can help take down Hisoka. This is because his skills have a limitation that whenever he steals something rare, the stronger his net ability can be. It's a risk to try to take them though, because they wouldn't have such precious items just lying around anywhere. In other words, Krollo's about to risk moving up to tier one and possibly being caught by cock and guards or Hisoka too soon, just to acquire them. But he's considered that he might face Hisoka before he's ready to, and he has a failsafe in place if that happens. We all know that he doesn't mind dying, so long as the spiders continue on without him. But this time, it seems like he's really been cooking up something big for that scenario. So he continues to use his Nen phone in hopes of finding the person with the ringing only heard by him, thankfully. Imagine hearing a noisy ringing while you're trying to mourn a cock and prince. The phone tells him something different this time. It found the person, but they're too far away to be contacted, which means Krollo has found the right spot, just not the right floor or tier that they're on. With only a limited number of calls available to him, Krollo can't be too hasty as he heads to the upper tiers. Could he be planning to follow Halkenberg's procession as it moves up to the higher levels, pretending to be a guard or otherwise to get access to the areas where you need to be invited? And if he does, what if he bumps into Hisoka, who's been strolling around looking for someone more interesting to face? And something else comes to mind. He has yet to see Karapaka and his connection to the princes. That would certainly be a hard decision for someone like Krollo, who'd either have to go after one who killed Uvogan, or Hisoka, who betrayed the troop and took out Kortopi and Shalnark. 
Also, I know this is extremely unlikely, but is it possible that the person Krolo's seeking that can kill Hisoka is actually Garapika? That would leave him with an even worse decision to make. But regardless, it just seems inevitable that Karapika and Hisoka team up with the troop getting nearer to their locations with each chapter. But let me know what you think about that theory in the comments, guys. And if you liked the video, please give it a like and please subscribe if you haven't already. Have a great day and I'll see you in the next one.